Welcome to the System Simplified Podcast, where we feature top leaders who share stories on how to successfully systemize a business. Now, let's get started with the show. Hello, and Dick Levitt here, the host of the System Simplified Podcast, where I feature top founders, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders about systematizing a business. And today's episode is being brought to you by Business Success Consulting Group, where we create, document, and implement processes and procedures so businesses can grow and thrive. And today's guest is Zach Miller. Hi, Zach. Howdy. How's it going? Great. Very good to have you on the show. I'm excited about this conversation. We are going to talk about how to be unique, a system on how to be unique. I hope that's what we do. (laughs) Yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about branding, about uniqueness, about, you know, and you have a great story to tell. So I know it's going to be very inspiring for our listeners. But uh, before we do that, I'd like to give a big shout out to Greg Tomshak, who introduced us. I did a great podcast with Greg, and we talked about Greg's experiences experience as a professional baseball player and what he brought to business from that experience. And Greg is a cybersecurity expert and we had a great conversation. So I'm going to put the show, I mean, our show notes, I'm going to have a link to that podcast as well. And I will encourage our listeners to listen to it. So first of all, Zach, can I introduce you, read the bio, and because it's pretty impressive, and I think our listeners are going to go, wow, yeah, Zach definitely knows what he's talking about. So you started your first business at the age of 10, and since then, you spent decades helping other people successfully start, grow, and dominate the business, um, their business through your company, Hatch. You use the skills um, detail in your book, and not Anomaly, How to Finally Stand Out from the Crowd. So that's your book. It's Anomaly, How to Finally Stand Out from the Crowd. And you use the principles in that book in order... Yeah, here it is. Here's the book. Okay. (laughs) And you use those principles to land an interview with Diamond John. Uh, You were chosen as the host of a business TV show on ABC. You talk business at the White House. And you got featured in Entrepreneur Magazine, and you wow the audience in a TEDx talk. And we're gonna, we, you know, if you we're gonna include that link in the show notes as well so people can see that. And you raised money from the team that started the Weather Channel. Wow. <laughs> and you have a podcast which is called Fervent Four, and you can check out that podcast as well. So definitely, I mean, so from the age of 10 till now full-time entrepreneur and you are helping others achieve um, the same success that you had. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So tell us you a learn, little bit you, more. Hmm? You learn a lot as a business owner at the age of 10. You know, when, you your, parent, when your parents don't have money to give you uh, just because, you know, you just grew up a little, uh, I don't know, middle class, lower class, whatever it's called. And they just, you know, the allowance that I wasn't uh, getting wasn't a, I wasn't able to afford the video games and maybe the the candy that I wanted at the time and I was mowing my own lawn I was like okay well I have a lawnmower might as well just see if I can make some more money off this so just started knocking on people's doors around the house or around the neighborhood and realized that um, surprisingly that's that's something that most business owners maybe aspiring business owners entrepreneurs they're terrified to do and will never do and by doing doing that at a young age, I learned that, okay, like going and introducing yourself to someone, it might be very scary, but a lot can happen because of it. And I, and I think I learned a lot from that. Look, I, I'm still, I'm 39 years old as we shoot this today. I still don't like doing it. I don't love going up to someone and be like, Hey, what's up, but I'll do it because I realized that they're likely not going to come up to me. I need to be the one to be proactive in doing that. And so uh, I just learned a lot from, from those early days and kind of, it's just all, stemmed on um throughout time and so whether it's you know that business or the current business you know you just learn little things from each and and i think that's uh, incredibly important in the process absolutely you know and i i mentioned in another podcast i just did is that 
I, I find it a common denominator of a lot of entrepreneurs and successful entrepreneurs is that they start working at a young age, right? They weren't lazy. They put hard work into it. And they realized that they can do it. And that gave them the confidence to actually continue and start multiple businesses and different adventures. So I definitely see it as a common denominator. Yeah. And growing up, I think, you know, entrepreneurship, even though I, you know, had my own business at, at the age of 10, it really wasn't something that schools were pushing at that point. There wasn't shows like Shark Tank at that point, which I think really kind of made it a buzzword, entrepreneurship, a buzzword. Like the last 10, 13 years have been really like, oh, it, it'll be cool to start a business. It's cool to be a startup founder. When I was, you know, going through high school and stuff like that, that wasn't, that wasn't the route that people said. So I, I, I think that has changed too. And it, it's unique how so many younger uh, individuals have this ability now to be like, oh yeah, I can do that route or I can do this route. It's not, it's not just a one, a one road route anymore. It's, it's a multiple road route and you get to choose which one, which is, which I think is pretty cool. I think so too. Absolutely. So what is, tell us a little bit more about Hatch. Yeah, I started Hatch. Oh, let's see. I think LinkedIn just told me it's my 13 year anniversary. Uh, I started it uh, maybe 11 year anniversary. I don't know, something like that. Um, I, I started it because I was I was uh, running an agency at the time, a software agency, and we were running into a lot of challenges where we would be building this piece of software for companies, but they would get it done and then they didn't know what to do with it next. It's like here here's this tool, here's this app. At the time it was, uh, this is when like, there wasn't a lot of apps on the app store. So like Apple and, and the Google play stores. So early, early on back then. And these, these entrepreneurs would invest hundreds of thousands of dollars for this tool. We'd get it on the app store and then it wouldn't do anything. And it was like, Oh, that's interesting. So I had figured out how to grow that business, but it was like, now I got to make sure that the people that we're building this tool for, we have this asset that they can figure out how to grow it. And so basically I stopped doing the the software side of things. And I started realizing that maybe the branding, marketing kind of exposure aspect of Hatch would be a, an opportunity for people to realize, hey, there's, there's this, you, the marketing aspect of your business is really important. Yeah, obviously the development of the product that you put together, the service that you put together is there, but if no one knows about it, it really doesn't matter. And it's it's funny how over the years, I think people have really started to finally figure that out where it's like, Oh, so I have this thing and they aren't going to Kevin Costner me just like in Field of Dreams and just show up. It's because I think he said, well, if you build it, they will come. And I think a lot of people think that. And it's like, mm, like it really doesn't work that way. Like there really has to be a, a legit roadmap, a playbook for, for people to, to follow a process, if you will, to, to, to have people realize that, yes, this thing might be the greatest thing ever, but if no one knows about it, it's going to stay that way. And so you have to make conscious efforts to, to, to have exposure, to, to get yourself out there, uh, to, to market the business. And you can't just as, as, as it's awesome as it would be to just do nothing and, and build something. It, it doesn't work that way. So, so Hatch really helps the companies kind of get to that, see, see themselves from an exposure standpoint out there uh, in, in the world of, yeah, of I agree business. with you. I mean, being you have to be and you have to be proactive. You have to actually put yourself out, and it's a massive. You have to be to do it massively in order for people to hear you. Because you know, we we were talking before the show, and you know, we we have to stand out so people will notice you. You have to get that attention because otherwise, it's just you're going to be one of many, right? So let's talk. You use the magic word for me: process. You know, we are all about process documentation. It's funny, I started this business about 11 years ago as well, 12 actually. And the reason why I did that is because I, just like you, you know, I was doing something similar. I was doing general business consulting, but then I noticed that as I was telling entrepreneurs, business owners to document the processes and procedures, you know, week after week, they will come and say, well, they didn't do it. It would just would not get done. So then I had the bright idea of, oh, well, how about if I document it for you? Go, yes. And I saw that that's like an amazing niche. And that is something that is unique, right? Because we don't find a lot of companies that do that, that actually are able to extract the knowledge and document it and give like a complete playbook as a result of that. So I can totally relate to it. So I'm really interested to talk about your system for exposure. Like what 
what do you recommend to your clients? What would you recommend to our listeners? To Where do they start and what are the steps that they should take in order to actually create that exposure and that and being noticed, basically? So surprisingly, a lot of businesses, a lot of a lot of brands, they don't document a thing. I'm, I'm in 100% agreement with you. I'm like, hey, yeah. like, what's worked? And they're like, well, I don't know. And I'm like, they're, and then they go, oh, well, we've tried a bunch of things. So I'm like, well, what did you try? And they're like, well, I don't know. I don't remember. And it's like, what do you mean? Like, you've tried all these things, you know, so it's like the bowl of spaghetti, spaghetti throw it against the wall, see which one sticks, write all those things down. Then the whatever one that one stuck, throw it up there again and see if it sticks. I mean, it's, it's right. as simple as that, right? So you hear people say, oh, my business, my marketing plan is I'm going to social, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do social media. Okay. Like, well, what does that really mean? And, and so they're just like, well, I'm just going to do social media. And they're like, so you're just going to post. You're going to, you're, you're going to have, you know what you're going to post. Do you know what you're going to say? Um, are you going to use images? Are you going to do videos? Do you, uh, someone the other day asked me, should I, should I use hashtags anymore? Like even just understanding simple aspects like that, like very like one-on-one -on -one level of stuff is, is, is the first thing that I would say is like, what do you actually want to, wh where generally do you think you want to spend your time from a marketing perspective? You know, right. is it, it, is it on social media on something like that? It, is it, is it video? Is it networking events? Is it blog post? Is it somehow, um, writing a book, you know, and, and getting exposure through something like that? Is it doing a bunch of podcasts? The first thing I would say is figure out where you feel comfortable and it, it, along the lines of the other piece of that is, and, and figure out where, where you want to be. Right. Because there's right. plenty of people like I, I'll ask someone, Hey, like, by the way, like this show is on video. Are you okay with that? I think people are a little bit more receptive of that now, three, four year, years since 2020. But like when I was doing interview shows, like in 2015, 2016, people were like, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know that I really want to do it. Like, can we just like, can I just do audio or can you just write about me? Like people didn't want to see their faces on the screen for whatever reason. And I think because of COVID now, I think people feel a little bit more comfortable doing this, but if someone doesn't want to speak for a living, if someone doesn't want to do this kind of communication, like I wouldn't force them because I think that that's a, that can be a really big challenge of trying to get that person to feel comfortable when they really want to be in a situation where it's blacked out like that. Right. So they don't want their face to be seen. Right. And so it's, as, as comical as that might seem to someone like me who speaks for a living, I have to respect where that person likes. And if, if they just want to write for a living, then, then we need to think about stuff like that. You also have to realize that most people are not creative and they don't understand why some people's, if we're talking about social still, why that works for some people when they don't have like a creative ounce in their body. And I think that that, that can be really important to realize, okay, like, when you're on social media, it's really just like your traditional TV. It's your traditional television. You're literally just channel surfing. That's all you're doing. Except in this case, you're just scrolling. You're scrolling on your phone, however you scroll on a phone, right? That's literally what you're doing. And if 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 something doesn't stop you, then you're not going to stop. So tonight, when you go home and watch Netflix, or whoever's listening is going home and watches and is going home and watching Netflix, realize that you're making decisions off of a two inch square on your TV screen. And as soon as you're scrolling through that, if that thing doesn't hit you, like that is the same effect as changing the channel over and over and over again, or on the guide that traditional on, on a, on a, on your traditional cable TV, you're just literally just scrolling until you find something. And so if something isn't compelling, then they're not going to stop. And so that creativity is an aspect of that. The brand aspect is important to that. You're making a decision off of a two inch block on the TV screen. That means that thumbnail, that picture, those words, whatever they show on that thing, that's incredibly important, right? And it, when you're reading a newspaper, the headline, literally I had a client today, actually it was Greg. Greg Greg was telling me today that he um, he writes a lot for, ink, uh, for ink.com. And they were like, the most important thing is your headline. And I'm like, it's true. Like, and that's what we've been focusing on. And so because his headlines are getting stronger, they are, they're getting more views. And I'm like, the reason behind that is because people aren't going to read all that stuff to figure out what they want. People are going to look at a newspaper. Nope, nope, nope. Oh, that's interesting. And typically the most important stories are at the beginning and the, the lower stories, if you will, are kind of at the bottom. And so it's like that, you, you got to figure out that headline aspect of it. So when you're trying to figure out where to start, where do you feel comfortable? 
Where, where do you want to, to hang out, right? Because you're going to end up investing time in these places. And do you have kind of a network in any of those places where you can grab into that already and be like, hey, hey, folks, it's me. I'm going to be doing this thing. Why don't you hang out with me there? Like figure out where, where that sandbox is and 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 play play in the sandbox. Good. So we figured that out. Then what? How do you get noticed? How do you actually make sure that you have the exposure that you want? Yeah, I think a lot of people try and get like kind of like these silly hacks where they'll, you know, write all bold, they'll write in all caps, they'll uh oh, they'll do like um a bunch of emojis or they'll like have um uh, you you've heard the term clickbait, so they'll have headlines that have very little to do or if anything to do with a headline. Like I think that's bad. I I, I think in general what you should do is try to get as concise as possible and then stay on brand as often as possible. Right. So if, if, if either of us were to go and ask our networks, Hey, like, you know, it's where it's, it's me. What do you think I do for a living? You know, how do you think I put bread on the table? How do you think I make money? What is that answer? And what I have found is that 99 out of a hundred times people's networks don't know what they do. So the closest people to but them. Why is it, Zach? Why don't they know what they do? Do you think it's because of the clarity of the message is missing? Or is it because people don't, because you didn't make yourself known? I mean, why? All I agree with you, but why Why is it? Okay. Yeah, I, I think they're not concise on, on their message. They they haven't stood out enough. They're, they weren't memorable. When they do communicate with people, those messages are not only off brand, but aren't, they're, they're not even doing it for a reason, right? So it's like, if you were to, if you were to start commenting on a bunch of stuff online, you generally want all those comments to be somewhere on brand with what you do. For sure. Because if not, then you just have a bunch of nonsense all over the place. And people are like, well, I don't, I don't really get, so I'm seeing it. I finally have seen this guy's message, but I don't understand where it is. So like you process, process documentation. That's it. Those are the two things. Like for me, it's like how to stand out, be an anomaly. Like those, those are the things that I want people to realize how to do. Like, so I would hope that someone would use words like that associated with me. Um, for and sure. With and you, that's I what we are right now when we are combining. So this is a great example. Like, you know, you're a guest on this podcast. I talk, we talk about, we're going to build the process of how to be memorable, right? Of how to yeah. stand out because then it combines those two brands and you are talking on your brand. I'm talking on my brand. That's an example. So I agree. It has to be on brand. That's for sure. That so is how, how many ads, yeah. how many ads do you think, you, how many advertisements do you think you see a day? Don't know. Take a I guess. guess. I, I wouldn't even guess because I don't, you know, honestly, probably not that much myself because I don't go on social media. I have my marketing sure. team that goes on, goes on sure. social media. I mean, I would for work, but not on personal because I find it, you know, I definitely, I, it's a, it's a time sucker and yeah, sure. probably, you know, I, I don't, I don't know what the average person would tell me how many. So the last time I've been able to find a concrete answer was 2013 and it's 5,000 ads a day. We really? are consuming 5,000 ads a day. So you could actually be doing a really good job of what you're doing from a marketing perspective. It just hasn't got, it hasn't gone through that cycle enough yet. So it's you not versus your competitor. It's you versus 4,999 others every single day. So when one person is like, I've done this thing, I, I wrote the most amazing blog post and it didn't work. It's like you wrote, one blog post you did one thing that thing was defeated by 4999 others that day what did you do the next day what else did you do to push that thing and so understanding that you can't just do one thing is also very important in this aspect because there's a lot of competition in there that isn't just your competition your eyeballs your 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 earbuds your your taste buds your everything is literally being marketed to in some sort of way. And if you're not jumping on that train and realizing that you're competing against thousands of others on a daily basis, I mean, at the end of the, at the, end of the week, it's 35,000 people. And that was 10 years ago. Who knows what that number is actually now? I'm sure it's somewhere still around there, but like 
That's a lot. I think that's it's, a, a, it's, a, it's a great amount of, I mean, I don't know where I would see 5,000 ads a day, but I trust you um, in terms of, you know, there's definitely a lot and you have to stand from the crowd for sure. Yeah. So, you know, we talked about remaining on brand, make sure that you have a clarity of your message. You very much know who you are, what you do. You create, you know, I, I did this great um, episode with um, Mitch about how to be Mitch Levi about how to be credible, you know, and then and then we talked about um how to create a line that people will remember, right? Like for me, like I work with companies that are uh, fast growing companies lacking consistency. It's very precise, very concise, very clear. You know, I'm sure you have yours, like who do you work with, right? Very clear, very to the point. Like you make people memorable, like you make the company's memorable, right? Stand from the crowd. You said it many times. I totally get it, right? This is what you do. So clarity of message is very important, but now let's talk about how do you make people memorable? Like how do you make the company memorable so people will actually remember? What are some of uh, some advice or tips that you can give us about that? I, I remember eight, nine, 10 years ago, I had been going to a lot of networking events. And at these events, I would, tend to dress similarly to the people that would attend there. Maybe not a suit, but definitely dressed up. You know, maybe a, a button down shirt, um, a nice pair of slacks, a polo shirt, something like that. And what I realized that I was looking like everyone else. I, I had something different where I was younger than a lot of the people in the crowd, but for some reason that wasn't necessarily turning heads. Then one day, I guess I was late or something, but I showed up in basically jeans and a, and a black t-shirt. And all the eyeballs started coming on to me. And I was like, well, that's interesting. But not only that, like it, it seemed that it had like a positive spin where people were like, oh, I want to go talk to him now. Where before that didn't happen. And that's kind of the first time I ever realized that I was like, huh, that that's really interesting. So, so potentially the clothes that you wear, right? So Some probably like if you were living in Portland, Oregon, you would have wore a suit in order to stand out from the crowd because if right, you come right. with jeans and black t-shirts, you're probably going to be just like everybody else. Yeah. So in that case, wear a suit and then you'll look very, you'll look very different, but that might be, you know, that might be the thing, at least, at least one time. So it became kind of a running joke. Like I just would always wear the same thing and people were like, Oh, there he is, you know? And so that was a brand that I felt comfortable enough. Now I realized and recognized that some people, number one, they might not be able to do that. Right. They might not feel comfortable uh, dressing down, if you will, but there are ways that you can enhance something. Right. So maybe it's it's a pair of earrings that are very fashionable. Maybe it's a necklace. Maybe it's it's uh, it's it's a lapel. Maybe it's a, um, a a scarf that's unique. Maybe it's a maybe you wear um, a, a watch band, you know, so they have uh, different color watch bands. Maybe it's something like that. Maybe it's a nice pair of glasses, some brettes in your hair. Maybe it's a jacket that's a a little bit unique, Some, something that isn't just what everyone else wears, right? And so, again, you're competing against others. So when you go into your next networking event, if you will, scan the room, see what everyone's wearing. Try to do a 180 difference to that and see what happens, right? Um, that's from a clothing perspective. From a, uh, it could be following up. You could just be really good at following up. 80% of people that you meet at a networking event or online are not going to follow up afterwards. So to be unique and to stand out, that means you only have to be the 20%. That means all you have to do is just send an email to someone, send a, uh, a DM to someone saying, hey, it was great meeting you. Pick up the phone. People don't do that anymore. Like, hey, it was really nice meeting you that 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 day. Thank you. You know, for I was doing thinking that. about it, like calling, you will stand out because people don't call. I mean, you can send a card in the mail. People don't do that. I mean, how hard that is was, it to do that? That was the next thing I was going to say, send a handwritten yeah. card, right? No one gets handwritten cards. No right. one. Literally, right. there's a chapter in the book about writing handwritten cards. No one does it. It's like, right. it, you get this thing in the mail. Like most of your mail looks all the same. It's a bill or it's a package from Amazon. That's <laughs> it. So if you send this handwritten card, right? Like it looks unique. Like I don't have any on my desk right now, but like I would find like rain, like the things that I would do is I would go to Wally World. And I'd spend 10 bucks on a hundred cards and you can get like these cards that are maybe this big, make four by three, five by three, something like that. They're rainbow colored, right? So there's all different colors. There's blue, there's yellow, there's orange, there's pink, there's red, whatever. Pick a color that you like, 
send it to the person. It gets in their mailbox. And when they're going sifting through all of their junk, they're like, oh, this this is not junk. This is an actual handwritten card. I'm going to open that up. And so you've actually gotten that person's attention by doing something that costs 51 cents and I don't know, 20 cents for the actual uh, for, for, for the envelope and, and card. That's not hard to do. It takes two minutes to write. If that, that alone is going to, is going to stick out. You know, I have a book so I could send that to people, you know, that cost me a couple bucks to send plus however much it cost me to, to write it. Those are unique things. If we're comparing, you know, McDonald's to Chick-fil-A, you could make the argument that they food wise make the exact same product, right? But what does McDonald's do that Chick-fil-A doesn't? Well, some people would say they're aggressive in in their kind of um, uh, in the cashier standpoint, where at Chick-fil-A, you say, thank you. They say, my pleasure. And they're just nice. That It could be as simple as that. Like, it doesn't have to be the look. It could be following up. It could be in your manners. Uh, it could be in the salutation in your emails. There's a lot of, there's a plethora of different ways that you can stand out by just doing something slightly different than what the norm is. You know, a lot of people say, sorry, like if you're in the grocery store, just walking by someone or at, you're at a networking event, you're trying to get by someone, you're like, oh, sorry, I got to get by. What if you said, pardon me instead? You know, it could be something as simple as that. And And by training yourself to start doing little things that are different, people will start recognizing you for being, for, for being unique in that case. Yeah, you know, it's um, also when you go to a networking event, you, um, you know, you can ask questions. You know, I had a great interview with Topher Morrison and he went over like, you know, how do you actually, what questions can you ask in order to get interest people to engage in a conversation, but it's different, right? So people, you know, I, I can meet you in a, in, a, in a networking event and said, hey, Zach, how are you? My name is Adi. What what do you do, Zach? You know, what's your business? You know, that's what you expect people to ask. Mm -hmm. But if you can ask a question that, you know, um, what was the highlight of your day? Oh, well, nobody asked me that one. You know, just like come up with bright question, bright ideas for questions that are different, that are breaking that over and over and over that that's what you expect. I'm, I'm literally but... writing I'm literally writing a book on that right now. It's like how to how to write standout icebreaker questions at networking events. My question when I meet someone at a networking event or anywhere, it's what are you watching on Netflix? Because most people at business events feel like they have to ask business questions and I don't really understand why because if you're trying to build and establish relationships, what that person does for a living really shouldn't matter in that 5 to 10 minute conversation, but if you can you know, figure out what they're watching on Netflix or something like that, you know, figure out what, what was the highlight of their day. Those are far more memorable questions than, uh, uh, Hey, what do you do for a living? Like, that's just so status quo and boring. It's just like, well, I hope I can give this pitch again. It's like, do you want to give that 10 minute, pit, you know, that, that, that pitch 10 times over the next 60 minutes? Probably not. Maybe you do, but like, I just don't think that those are as, as valuable as, as people should give them credit to be because asking or, you, or you can give the pitch, but when you actually do, when you do what you just said, you kind of like get their, grab their attention and they go, Oh, okay. Well, and then they start really communicating, not just uttering words. Right. And then they can actually listen to you. Well, when you meet someone and you, t and they ask you that question and then they realize, well, I don't, I don't really care for that anymore. As the first question it's you basically have just wasted your time. And right. it's just like, all right, well, uh, sorry, I sell uh, life insurance. I'm a real estate agent, you know, like, oops, like, don't hate me. But you know, that's, that's what happens a lot. You go to these events, and those are the type of people. And then people are, they're just like, yeah, whatever. Like, I don't want to hear another one of these pitches. And it's just like, well, then don't talk about it. You know, like, they might need you. So figure out a way to speak. Well, they to know somebody else that can connect you. It's all about the connections, right? right? Right. Good. Any other ways that you feel like a person can make themselves memorable or the way you help your clients make themselves memorable? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's uh, updated headshots on, on whatever your socials are. Uh, your business card could be unique. Um, some people are really getting away from business cards, um, but if you are going to do a business card, I think you can you could make it unique in some sort of way. Maybe you have a dog walking service. You could have it be like a dog paw. Maybe your business card is literally just your your book. Um, maybe it's uh, just a phone number with your name on it. Something or or uh, you know a tagline that could be unique in there. Uh, so, something unique in. Hey, but you, you know, know what? You can also have a QR code as your a business QR card. QR code, yeah. 
you know yeah. so you can it can lead to some kind of a cool um simple landing page where you have exactly. all the details oh wow this is amazing how did you do that and then they start talking to you because they want to do the same and they want to find out how you did that and then you follow up and you can have more conversations with them and then guess what that just that Absolutely. process that's part of the process you know I, I think people don't recognize that it's like hey this is this is the process that we're talking about like the steps that you're going to need to take like yes that's a process that's a roadmap you follow these things you're increasing your probability to to have whatever that result is and I think most people just go into these things like, Woo, I hope this works, you know, not, not the process piece. They just go in like, I'm just going to go, you know, meet some people and we'll see where it goes. No. Right. Good luck. You know, Zach, we talked <laughs> about uniqueness in the business development, you know, standing out, but I think there is also has to be uniqueness. You have to stand from the crowd in the way you deliver your service and what you do, right? You gave the Chick-fil-A example well you know you say thank you i mean you say thank you and you say you, you're welcome right or my pleasure which is basically it's it's part of the customer service so i think if you have amazing customer service that is really engaging and really caring i mean you will stand out from the crowd that will be a memorable experience that people will then relate it to their friends and family and colleagues and that is the word of mouth that is so valuable. How, how often have you gone through a situation and been like, man, like, I cannot believe that's the way that this business community, customer service runs. I like, I'm, I'm shocked at that. Right. And then you're like, well, I hope that's not my business. I hope my business doesn't act like that. So what I would do is I'd fake call that, right. Or call someone, put it on speakerphone and, and see how they communicate with you. Because like, what do they call those? Like, um, uh, Ghosts, not um yeah it's like when, you know, when they, someone they goes try, in and like yeah. figures out like they're faking it through someone else they pay someone to kind of figure out what the what it's looking like like do that with your business or when you're in a bad experience through you as a as a consumer like take note of that and just make sure that you never do that yourself because right. if if you're putting your business through a scenario that you hate yourself like if you hate getting that cold call you know saying hey buy my thing is it really the best thing for you to then do that yourself? Like, what you know, it's so scenarios? interesting because I, I, we're on the same page. It happened to me last week. You know, I got, and it's a company that I use their services, but they call me and I asked them not to call me, please, in the middle of the day because I'm never going to, I can't. It's just not, I didn't yeah. sign up for their service to get calls to upsell me. Nothing wrong with upselling, nothing wrong with calls. And we talked about pick up the phone, but if the person is not the right method of communication, right. and I thought to myself, you know, I don't want to do it to others because if I get annoyed by it, I'm not going to do it myself to others because it is annoying, right? So I think it goes back to find out what the person is comfortable with. I'm not saying don't try and don't call because calling is definitely, um, you know, a method of getting attention and selling, but it is also consulting your clients of what's the best method of, for the, you to communicate to them. And that can make you memorable and unique as well because maybe go wow nobody ever asked me that question that's amazing that you're ask, asking me yeah so like when i start communicating with someone like i go hey is, is the way that we're communicating right now is this the best way to communicate is this the best way to talk like like where where are we on this because you know if you'd rather do a call like this would you rather meet in person would you rather would you rather text would you rather like where, where do you want to communicate let's let's play in that sandbox because I say that because it's it's important because if the person doesn't feel comfortable like in a situation like a like a Zoom call or you know something like that they want to be on FaceTime they want to meet face to face like you got to figure out what those where that place is and you're going to improve your probability of keeping that client or gaining that person as a client that company as a client if you do those things and you're right it will stand out because no one's ever asking that question they just do it and think oh well they answered so they might as well like this when you don't realize yeah. like are they actually having to leave a room because they're at their office because they're they're not supposed to be on this phone and they're tr trying to be like they're, they're they're being shy by moving into a different location? You, know, you just don't know. You don't know what the person is doing on the other end of that call, and so it's figure out where they feel safe. What's a great way to communicate, and better things will happen. Absolutely. You know, I remember there was a commercial by I think it was an insurance company. I remember a few years ago where they proud themselves of like, when you call, you actually get a real person. And it was kind of funny. They made it funny, right? Because somebody's calling and they think they're talking to a machine. So they're kind of like talking to a machine and the person, oh, I'm a real person, you know? Yeah, yeah. So that can be a difference, right? And I, and I think, you know, it got me thinking 
that it's really about observing what is out there and what's the what's common and how can you be memorable different but also something that people would like so you know unfortunately our world is very it's it's very you know there's a lot of um it's very artificial intelligence and mechanics and all that i mean it's definitely helpful but it's also you expect now when you call somewhere that you're going to get you know, like an answer machine, press one, press two, and sometimes you can't even press anything because they really direct you to where they want. And for you to actually say what the problem is, and then they, you know, and then it spits at you all these automatic answers that you, all you want is customer service as an example, right? So mm -hmm. what is it? It's like a cold, unrelatable, no, not personable world. So if we actually also differentiate ourselves by being kind, warm, human, caring, sympath empathetic, I think that is also something that people will remember because they will remember how you treat them. I, I, I often talk about the company Panera, Panera Bread, and I think they do a really good job of, I, I like to use companies that people actually have used. So you're not just talking about some random company that people don't know. So I think Panera has done a really good job of figuring that out where they're like, okay, traditionally, you know, 10 years ago, the way that you, you ate there is you walked up to the counter and you ordered your food. And then they saw, okay, oh, okay, well, maybe we can start adding these little kiosks that people will start ordering at. And they, so they started doing that. Then they realized that, oh, some people are just coming in to get coffee. Why don't we have a coffee only machine? And then the coffee cups right there, right? And then they can take it. Then they realized that people are wanting to order online, but sit at a seat or order online and come pick it up. It's like figuring out like what works for your customers. And I think a lot of times people are like, oh, I only have one type of customer, so I should only do one type of thing. Well, I just gave what four, five, six examples of of Panera's customers who are looking at different ways of of wanting to get the same thing. They just are going to do it in what's convenient for them. And and I think a lot of a lot of other companies have said, "Oh, well, maybe we should do to go orders like that. Maybe we should do mobile orders." You know, you know. And so looking at stuff like that and being like, "Okay, what what's the easiest thing that I can do to make my customers' lives like amazing?" Because at the end of the day, if if your customer hates being there, you're really decreasing your probability of them coming back. And at the end of the day, all you want is them to be happy because they're happy. All those other things that you want to happen, word of mouth, them to come back in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those aren't going to happen if they're not happy. And so do whatever you can to make them happy. Don't, you know, you're at a restaurant and the, and the manager comes around and is like, oh, how was your meal? You know, like, I feel like that is like most people probably don't tell them how the meal is. They lie and they're like, "Oh, it was a, it was great, thanks." You know, is there a way that they can actually communicate with that in a in a non intrusive way a little bit after, like right afterwards, after after they're done with the meal? Um, that that would be a way that I think that that can improve because people are afraid to. The reason people don't want to get that sales call is they don't want to say no, right? They feel bad telling someone no, right? You're at a restaurant, someone says, "How was your meal?" Oh, it sucked. They're not going to tell them that, even though that's what they're thinking. Because most people feel bad about that. Figure out a way that you can do that in a positive way, maybe a couple minutes after. And I think you'll learn a lot more about how your business is doing. I think so too. Absolutely. Well, Zach, we're coming to the end of our um, podcast here. How can our listeners get a hold of you? Yeah, the best way is um, another quick little hack is uh, everything that I uh, do is under Zach Miller Says. So ZachMillerSays.com. On, on all social, it's at Zach Miller says, Z-A-C-K-M-I-L-L-E-R-S-A-Y-S. -L -L -E and I do that intentionally so that I only had to say it once, you know, and uh, other companies will be like, oh, you know, you got to go to this handle here, go to that handle here. The website's something that's weird. Make make all of your brand under one one channel so that it's easy for them to find you. So Zach Miller says wherever wherever you want. Amazing. Great. Well, thank you so much for being a guest on our, on this podcast. And before we, I mean, I also want to mention that they can, I'm sure it's on your website as well, but it's also your book, Anomaly, How to Finally Stand Out from the Crowd. So I'm sure that they can also see it on your website. You can also- on website, get, Amazon, wherever, yeah, Amazon, Audible, all those. Absolutely. And they can places. also see your interview with Diamond John, right? On your website. Yep. Absolutely. Go to the website, zachmillersays.com. Great. Well, Zach, a pleasure having you. Thank you so much for this conversation. It was wonderful. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.
Thanks for listening to the System Simplified podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.